Yeah, I'm like 20. We played our first gig our senior year of high school. That's right. Even younger than you guys. Imagine that. <laughs> and she's else?
recorded it from my solo CD, woodcuts by recording one part and overdubbing the other part. Um, and it works just perfectly from the music. I mean, all we're doing is playing it down an octave from where it's written because the guitar sounds an octave lower. And um, just leaving out a few notes here and there, like on these kinds of things. It's actually written. But if we did all those, there wouldn't be any flow. So there's just a few notes we left out like that. And um, I would say we've played around with it a lot since the way I, I recorded it pretty straight, I think, for my CD. At the, that point, my thought process was, well, these are tangos. And um, especially the second movement, it, it never quite made sense to me how that is a tango. Because <laughs> it, it um, I mean, there's bump, 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 you know, things that are like, out of tangos, but it was so, it seemed to want to be so free that what I did for my record was I left a click track on and I tried to play incredibly freely around the click track being on as my way of sort of trying to tune into, you know, sitting into a tango or a steady rhythm. Um, but we've sort of veered away from that and it's been fun to explore with Janet. To just, you know, it's always fun to have ideas, someone else's ideas back and forth, so it's changed quite a bit from how it sounds on my CD. <clears throat> trying to find, when, when I did transcript, class, class book transcriptions when I was in college, um, I think I was then just trying to find the most notes I could wrap my malice around. You know, it's like, how difficult can I get with piano music and still get around? Like I did a Bach French suite with, you know, two moving voices just to see if I could do it. And, um, now I think I sort of have a different view of it, that it's, well, this is a, a big thing for me now to want to get back into transcriptions in a big way, with Madame Rubio. Um, having played uh, tons and tons of contemporary music with Mermelin, in 11 years we premiered almost, I lost count, but somewhere near 80 pieces. So that's what I've been doing the last 11 years, and hardly anything but that get that many premieres off the ground. And now I'm really feeling like one thing that brought me to Madame Rubio was thinking, well, it's terrific to play contemporary music and um, serve composers and you know really serve your musical community that way um, and have a hand in the literature growing for the instrument. And we, know, we all know that whole rap. Um, but then I started to think, how much of what I'm playing is really coming from my heart? And what would that be? And I started just in the last year thinking, what music do I want to play that comes from my heart and not just what I'm trying to play to, you know, serve good composers and, and uh, champion the composers I think are great. And um, so now my outlook on transcriptions is, a, what will come from my heart would be, um, I feel like we really succeeded in the first program we put together, which drew pieces for guitar, um, string quartet, piano, Janice drew the transcription of the harpsichord piece. So we have all these uh, you know, pieces coming from different places, but I felt very proud of it because it seemed like the adaptation we made made the music as effective in our setting as it was for the original instrument. And so that seems to me like um, an important goal to have. And, um, and, now the, and that that could be a big service to the professional literature because we can't only be expected to play 20th century music or 21st century music pretty soon, you know, just because that's all that's authentically written for us. <laughs> a long answer to it. Yeah. 
seem to have a lot of colors at your disposal. And I know some, uh, technique is, in, in a sense, invisible. And you can't really see certain things that you do. It's all inside. Mm -hmm. And you seem to play very controlled and close to the bars. Mm -hmm. What exactly do you, is that, does that, do you think that comes from, what part of your body does that come from? Um, those different colors and changes of sound. And it's the same dynamic, but oh, it definitely changes. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that a lot? Tons. Yeah, I don't fun. think I play a note that I'm not thinking what color or attitude do I want this note to have. Do you work on it? Um, not in the sake of, okay, let me play this one passage ten different ways, but you know, just in the course of learning anything, you know, I stop and call myself on, all right, you're not putting anything into this passage. What, what are you trying to do here? You know, so just, you know, in the course of things. Um, the playing low comes from Ian Finkel, who was my <laughs> teacher when I was um, in the last two years of high school. I studied malice very intensely with him. And um, so, you know, he, the, I've gotten away from that at this point, that I'm not, you know, always just like right here, but um, that, that's sort of where it came from, and then trying to would get my general, what Janet calls big, of just like being right there and imagining that my image is that I'm not hitting the surface of the bar, but I'm hitting like an eighth of an inch underneath the surface of the bar. That's my target point, so I feel like I'm always just I'm trying to be in it. And um, the color thing comes I'm, a lot from Marimelin. Um, working with a violinist for that long, and a violinist, I mean, playing, here's an instrument that has a hundred standard uh, orchestrational effects that composers all know to use. You know, if we get together with a composer, we've got to tell them, you know, you could write a phrase mark. Oh, you can, you can write a phrase mark on the you know. And so we're still at that level with composers of filling them in on, you know, oh, you could write, you could have dead strokes, you could, oh, you know. And, but then here's a violin that, um, you know, everybody knows a hundred standard things to do with La Tondo and different kinds of pizzas and different colors and by the bridge and you know, all this stuff. And so that commonly got written into all the parts Sharon's playing. And then I felt like, well, gee, I'm just sort of a boob here, <laughs> so, you know, just playing the notes. So then that really inspired me to, well, if she's playing Flotondo, you know, well, what am I going to do to lighten up? And so that, that was one thing that really kicked me in the butt to try to look for colors. from scratch all over again, we had a certain amount of mapping already laid out 
and that sort of went with the line. That was, we didn't have to say every single line, we're going to make a crescendo here, we're going to make a this here. It was just sort of like, if, it, if I was the leader, then she would follow what I did. And so we're always listening back and forth for that. So I don't think the dynamic things were said, but we did decide, you know, which lines were important. Well, it was probably more instructive that we did this piece, mm -hmm. one of the first things we did, because it just music is trading things back and forth, and that probably gave us the idea of, like, okay, who can lead all the time? Or, well, <coughs> yeah, so could you do that before you even started playing the music, just kind of look at it mentally before you even started playing it, or did you kind of do that as you were doing it? Actually, I think with this piece, I said, okay, you have it here, I have it here, because I had very carefully marked in my score from having um, recorded it and mixed the piece, and I had all these very, you know, right. <laughs> exact <laughs> mixing notes of right. how I, which part we were going to so. We sort of found, too, that something's changed <laughs> when we, um, each of the programs was divided up, like I had arranged a couple, and she had arranged a couple, and we, not never purposely, but we sort of ended up like, you know, she knew that work better at the beginning than I did. So she kind of, you know, took hold of, of just letting me know what was going to happen. And then when we did the Hinastera, it was a little bit the opposite. Like I, I knew right away what the sounds were coming up and, and what she had in her part. I didn't even have to look at the score. You know, but so I it, also it worked that way too. Even more than you. <coughs> Same notes? No. So far, we've been pretty much each using what we feel like using, and then occasionally it, we talk about, well, are we, do we have to use the same word? <laughs> right. No. Um, so it's more like, because you know we have different techniques and different concepts of stroke, and so many things are different that I, it would almost be. It's only the tip of the iceberg to match the mouth. So it's, you know, so we've sort of found that it's more important to just sort of see what we get going first. But we are, we try to be aware when we're trading something off that mm -hmm. I don't have to match her mouth, but I have to match her sound. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So my mouth can't be the same because if I'm concentrating on the high level of the instrument, I mean, it's obviously going to be thuddy, and she always has a softer or even two softer sticks than I hold in the entire concert just because of the range of the instrument that she deals with mostly. So we have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Talk about your grip. <coughs>
and trying to really articulate our tympany, or I can just let it you know, drop. And I think that's one thing that's particularly pleasant about this riff. Um, also, this reminds me, I was just thinking, I didn't answer the whole question about where, where my sound comes from. I think I think mostly about um, it's in my my hand, I think, and, and playing around with the with different um, tension or different amounts of touch on the amount, either gripping or not gripping, um, but then also I think my real power reserves from that here somewhere. Like I'm really thinking of any time my need power is from there. So um, I'm also kind of just thinking uh, about you know how when you lift a box you're supposed to you know bend down and get it like this and if it's really heavy like to think about your center and you know tighten your stomach muscles you know, and that helps you feel like you can look at more. And I think um, you know, for this next piece I'm playing it's for Steve's piece. There's a lot of things that are it's one one thing that this piece really explores is the different registers. So there's a lot of stuff on bread from top to bottom. And that's one time I really think about this center and thing rather than this limbs all the way over there and this oh, I gotta remember these two guys doing this thing. I'm really just thinking that's the central control here. <laughs> so that's another place that I really think of. Yeah. I noticed in the um, tango scene there were a lot of times um, where you had a lot of uh, large movements um, up and down the instrument. Um, I was wondering how much you actually consciously work on um, moving around. As far as you know, with uh, playing with one hand on one note mm -hmm. down here and then moving up there, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm only conscious of how I'm moving to the extent that I want to feel very free to move, mm -hmm. and so um, I'm basically thinking, um, like I tell my beginning students, you know, imagine you're playing. by uh, Bill Mersch, Bob Van Sice, and me, or I, me. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Uh, in 1993, we commissioned three solo pieces by Steve Mackey, Gunther Schuller, and Eugene O'Brien. And um, uh, since then, and as a result of this commission, I married this composer. <laughs> um, Bill actually premiered his piece, and I premiered Gunther Schuller's piece, but, um, yeah, no, no. Um, uh, the title 
Well, let me say the main thing about the music is, is that Steve was really trying to explore, as I said, the different registers. And um, his main, the main idea of the piece is uh, the idea of storytelling and the inflections that a storyteller uses and the way it's compelling to hear a storyteller quote somebody or describe something, just the whole kind of rhythm that comes from personal storytelling. And um, I've played it, I think, now about five times or so. And the last time I did was the best ever, so I'm really scared today. Like, can I top that or even <laughs> match it? But um, um, one thing I've discovered in the course of doing it a few times is that have to be sort of calm because part of storytelling, you know, when you've really got a whole audience captive, is making them feel like, and next, the, you know, just the, that's one of the rhythms is just that to, to be slow with it and let it just unfold. Um, one of the main ideas, which probably we'll just jump back to, is the idea of bass notes.
had, he'd written it all regular, that little uh, quiet raindrop section in the middle, dead stroke. And one day, uh, I was practicing it unevenly, because I was just sort of trying to, you know, sort out the stretches and stuff. And he came, like, tearing into the room and said, wow, i got to rewrite this. And he liked it uneven. <laughs> <laughs> And also, it works because it's in, you notice at the beginning, um, the one thing is like, when, I, when Steve first came up to, you know, for me to show him my marimba, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I was playing some different kinds of roles, you know, and I said, well, you know, this is a role, and then, you know, I don't think anybody's ever written this, but you could start to get jumbly with it like that. And he said, oh, I love that. So that's how his first roll, the instructions are, begin flowing, begin flowing tremolo, so that it sounds awkward, unbalanced, and irregular, by playing into the bar with quasi dead strokes for the tremolo, like a mechanical failure. So, Yeah, okay, because now we've got another uneven 